All right, thanks very much this afternoon. Um, earlier in the week, I gave a presentation to a group uh, with the Gottstein Trust um, Professional Development Program. That was by Zoom. It's pretty soulless, so it's really great to actually be here in a room with people, looking at reactions, seeing what people are actually thinking. So it's um, yeah, my pleasure to be here this afternoon. So in terms of our project, the first one in the set of five projects is looking at can we change the rotation length for both softwood, so make it shorter, so you get returns sooner, or hardwoods, make it shorter or make it longer. So we're trying to look at what else can we do, what kind of options do we have? I always like to include a conflict of interest statement, um, given the work I do in the legal and financial space. So I have no pecuniary interest in the outcomes, just hope that people enjoy the presentation and take something away from it. In terms of acknowledgements, I really think it's important to acknowledge this um, support that we've got for this project from PERSA. Um, but more importantly, the fact that Liz and Amy got together, so Liz from the, um, the hub and Amy from PERSA, and worked out a coordinated approach to research. You see too often in Australia at the moment there, there's a lack of coordination between projects. So it's actually really good to see projects coordinated, part of noble portfolio and having natural linkages. In terms of access to sites, ABP, Australian Blue Gun Plantations, gave us access to one of their trials, which is really useful, as did Peter Feast. And Peter's in the room here today, and he allowed us to make use of his um, wide space pines. In terms of the purpose of the project, as I said, what we're trying to do is look at can we change the rotation length to something shorter or longer, again, to try and meet the needs of farmers who are growing trees, because it's all about timing in terms of the farmer's needs. So in terms of today, we'll talk a bit about the journey, introduce the team that undertook this project, uh, look at wood properties as a fundamental consideration, look at the question of defining value, harvesting costs, and then what are the alternatives? So in terms of the team, we pulled together a really good team of people, each focused on a specific part of the information base. I won't go through all the names. We have some of the um, uh, illustrious characters here in the room today who are talking next. But it was really useful to have people who knew exactly what they're talking about, talking about specific bits. Then my job was to pull all the components together like a jigsaw puzzle into a financial model. So in terms of the financial model, effectively what we're trying to do is work out what is the outcome from a financial perspective. There is physical benefits for trees on farms, but we're talking about the financials, the dollars part of it. So we looked at the history of silviculture in the GT. And it's really important to understand that GT has led the way in so many aspects of civil culture for Australia and overseas in terms of sustainability, good practice and just good tree growing. So we took that history, we combined it with some stand information from uh, the wide space pine that Peter had, as well as the Australian blue gum plantations um, blue gum trial, which was looking at different spacing techniques. From that, we got the um, cost profile for running a tree program and David Geddes pulled that together, so the establishment costs, management costs. We then looked at the question of how much does it cost to harvest and haul the trees, which was Lou's um, area of expertise. We then considered what are the products and what are the prices that you get paid. It's often said that the actual returns from farm forestry can be a bit of a mystery because it's, um, it's a, not that widely publicised actual prices paid for logs. So we got that information, we pulled it together, and then combined them with the wood properties. And the wood properties is really important because that's what defines the, the utility of the tree, the utility of the log, and making it useful for the actual processes. So the model output was then a financial outcome, so a discounted um, cash flow at 4% real, as well as the physical product, so how much wood was going to be produced. So in terms of defining value, it's, a really, it's an interesting one. One of the things that the forestry space faces is that tree growers grow volume, Processors want particular wood attributes so they can actually turn those logs into something useful. There's not much of a connection between the two when you've got two separate groups, but you're seeing companies now who are vertically integrating owning forests and trees, either directly or in a sort of a, um, a cousin-type relationship, and they're starting to work out the value is actually understanding the wood and making sure the best wood's going into their plants. When we talk about the end products, um, that really, from a software point of view, we're talking about structural timber, so the wood that we build houses with, which is in short supply around Australia, and also export wood chips, which ultimately end up mostly as fine papers. We don't produce any photocopy paper in Australia anymore, as of a couple of weeks ago. So we've got to import all that material from overseas. 
If you think about what we're producing, we have to look at the markets today and how they are. So this is a mate's um, house being built in Gippsland, where I come from. There's a whole range of products in there. You've got the structural timbers holding up the roof. You've got all sorts of composite products. You've got um, panel board materials. So there's a whole range of things made out of a tree. Will that be the same in 20 years' time? I doubt it. We'll probably look at more engineered type products. But we need to start with what we can currently sell at the moment to help inform our process going forward. So this is a little bit of an aside, given we have an agricultural um, audience. So I want to just show you that tree growing is not so different to agriculture. If you take a 500 kilogram steer and you assume that 500 kilograms is 100%, when that steer goes through the first stage of the process and ends up as a hanging carcass, you end up with just under 6% as a hanging carcass. You have the byproducts of that process. If you then take the carcass and break it up into the, the different meat components, you get this breakdown of um, the different aspects of what that carcass from the live animal through to the products looks like. So you've got this quite nice profile, which I pulled together with the help of an agricultural um, student. That's the same profile done from a mature radiator pine tree. Looks pretty much the same, two separate slides. Put them side to side. It's almost like Leonardo da Vinci's you know, rules of nature. The ratios are pretty much the same. So it's the same principle of forestry. We need to have a market for all our components of both the growing process, as well as all the components of when we're actually processing our trees and make sure it's profitable. So when we talk about defining value and how do we compare different regimes, it's about how much wood you grow, the quality of the wood, how much does it cost to grow that wood, then what sort of price do you get paid for it? So this is a pretty crude equation, but this is the kind of value proposition we're talking about for growers. So if you're trying to assess trees, you can cut them down and do destructive sampling, but you kind of like, um, you know, understand the tree too late. What we've got a new system which Jeff Downs is the, um, I call it the grandfather of, is a system using a resi tool which actually bores through the tree and the degree of resistance of the wood, so different wood properties, change how easy or hard it is for that drill to go forward and you can record the attributes inside a tree. So we can start to assess trees while they're standing to understand what's going on inside the tree. From an agricultural perspective, it's the same thing as using an ultrasound over the back of an animal to try and work out its muscle score, its fat score. So we're looking inside the tree to try and work out what's going on. And that's important to understand what's good and what's no, not so good in terms of growing trees. When you look at wood properties, this is a series of um, charts from the ResiTool output showing uh, six different tree profiles. All the trees are the same size, but not all trees are the same in terms of wood properties. So if we look at this chart, the first one here with the orange, that's all the timber that would come out of those trees, which is not structural. It's not strong enough to hold up a roof of the house. So it's less than what they call NGP 10. So it's a machine grade pine 10. <coughs> if you look at the other side, the purple one, you've got super strong wood. It's really high quality. It can hold up that roof. It's what the market wants. So in between, when we're trying to manage trees, we want trees like this with a very small core of that non-structural wood. And then the rest of the outside is the really good stuff which you can hold up the roof with. So when we look at regimes, we want to try and develop something that can actually hold the roof up, but give the best returns to the growers. From a Tasmanian blue gum point of view, this one was done by destructive sampling. So we cut trees down, we took wedges out at um, different heights up the tree, and we looked at the wood properties. So how strong the wood was as a measure um, by using basic density. And you can see that the variation up the tree, so there's a pretty standard sort of um, basic density up to about 10% of the tree height, then it starts to vary. So by understanding that variation, we can understand the value of that tree, which is, again, quite useful from the point of view of processing. Okay, so the real driver of returns to the grower is the, um, the harvesting costs. So how much does it actually take to get that tree from your forest to a processor is the harvesting cost plus the haulage. The haulage costs are pretty fixed because once you've got stuff on a truck, it's just weight. Getting it from the stump to the roadside on the truck is the really expensive part, which can be made cheaper or um, more expensive depending on how you manage your trees. What we did with this, we looked at the whole question that when you're harvesting, you're using a machine. That machine cuts off the tree, handles each tree individually as a stem. So if you've got a really big tree, 
that fixed amount of steps is producing more wood per movement. And if you've got a really small tree, you're producing a lot less wood per movement. So with bigger trees, your costs go down. With little trees, your costs go up. That starts to look at what's important of how you grow your trees. So we look at the cost profiles for trees in Mount Gambia, and this is some great work that Lou did. Lou got a whole series of cost profiles of different kinds of operations in radiator pine at different stages against the mean tree value across the bottom axes for how much it costs per tonne to move the wood. You can see it's a pretty neat kind of pattern. When we pulled it together onto the one chart, it was surprising how neat that pattern was, which then allowed us to do a bit of wizardry of Excel and generate a one-stop cost profile for all different sizes, sizes of tree. So in the model, when we vary, say, how many trees you've planted or how few, it would then generate what that harvesting cost profile is going to be as an indication of returns from that tree growing enterprise. The same thing for um, Tasmanian blue gum, a little bit different. Those bottom set of lines, when we put the cost profile in, you can generate that. But the two ones above it, where the arrow's pointing, they're for a very different operation. We're actually turning the trees into wood chips on site. So there's extra sex, extra costs. So with those two models, we're able to build into our analysis to look at the different types of regimes, what the impacts were in terms of costs, and therefore what were the returns for the different regimes. We started off with a range of different options to test. There was good thing about hundreds of different regimes. We narrowed it down thinking, we want to go from a long rotation cycle to something a bit shorter, something much shorter, and something super short as the variation. And the same thing with our hardwoods. So we wanted to go from a um, standard hardwood regime around about 10 to 12 years for clear fall for chip. What happens if we grow up longer to make bigger trees for potentially other products or just bigger trees for chip? What happens if we make it a much shorter regime? What does that do? Remembering back to the question that as you decrease your tree size, your harvesting costs go up. We, t we tested a range of regimes for both the hardwoods and the softwoods. So from the radiator pine point of view, the green bar is business as usual, so that's the sort of standard case. The first two changes are clear falling a little bit earlier. So the second of those um, alternative shorter rotations is you don't do any third thinning. So you end up with more trees to harvest finally. Then there's a couple of super short regimes. We're talking about 12 year clear fall for pines. Then there's a series of wide space regimes, and the last of the wide space regimes included um, pruning with a price premium for your logs. You know, there currently isn't, but what would happen if there was? This is the one that's interesting, thinking about trying to compact your non-structural wood to the smallest possible area. If you plant more trees to start with, the individual trees, when you do your first things, are smaller. So the wood, which is non-structural, is on a smaller cross-section. Once you release the trees, the wood that's grown is of better quality, more usable in a sawmill. <coughs> okay, so to present the outcomes, I developed this matrix. Across the bottom is total yield. Across the um, vertical axis is a value index, so net present value. What we did was set number one, so it's an index, for the routine current fearful regime for radiator pine, then benchmark the other options around that um, regime. If you look at the first two dots there, that's about having a slightly shorter rotation than the current standard, but including with and without that third thinning. Interesting, when you exclude the third thinning, you're not having cash flow earlier because those trees are growing on, but you're also harvesting smaller trees, so your costs go up. So it's actually less attractive in this particular analysis to not do that third thinning. You look at the next lot, which is our wide space trees. We're talking about 370 stems per hectare. So quite wide space right from the start. Where there isn't a price premium or you try and grow those trees for a shorter period of time, your returns are going to be a lot less because you're not getting return on having those trees growing wider or the extra effort of going and pruning those trees. If you look at that top point, if there was a price premium for those logs, you'd end up having a much better position if you could sell those logs as pruned uh, logs into a particular market. The really smart strategy that Peter did with these trees was he knew the area was too small to get the first thinning done, so coming in and removing those trees. So he planted basically final stocking. So the strategy to try and get around some practical issues. The challenge now is to find a market that wants these kind of trees. And just to show what, oh, sorry, the last point is when we start talking about um, a super short type um, 
grayed out a pine regime, is not that attractive because the harvesting costs go up. If we look at that top one, this is where the theoretical thing is saying we'll make our wood much better by really con uh, confining the, the poorer quality wood to the centre and hopefully the wood on the outside is worth more so those logs are worth more. That becomes a more attractive regime because uh, it's just producing better wood. Whether it would work in practice and how it's going to um, play out is something that we'd really need to test. So just to make sure, pictures worth a thousand words, this is Peter's stand, it's, it's magnificent. You walk in there and you think, that's a good stand. But in terms of wood properties, the strength of the wood, because it's been grown so well, is lower, and therefore it's not as attractive for structural timber. But if we could get a, a premium for those pruned logs, it would be a much better outcome. Let's look at the blue gum regime options, starting with the green column, which is our uh, starting case, business as usual. Then we have a second option next to it, so moving across, I can use the, the pointer thing. That one there, that's when you do whole tree chipping, so you're taking the whole tree to the roadside. Um, you're producing, in this case, we're modelling for simple things, the same amount of volume, but it's a different system. If you go to the next two options, super short, we're growing a lot less volume per hectare, making it um, you know, smaller trees, and therefore more expensive. Then we go to the last lot where we're looking at a combination of much longer rotations. So you end up with bigger trees. So in the scenarios there, we've included um, the late clear fall, so we're talking you know, 18 to 20 years, and then one where you have saw logs, one where you don't, one where you've done a, a thinning at an earlier age, one when you, uh, others when you don't, and looking at the question of the last one, which is a, a late clear fall with pruning to try and make those logs worth more. Again, the same story, looking at the value, looking at the yield. That's the starting point, that's our business as usual. So everything that's above that and above to the right is a much better outcome in terms of your regime. So let's look at what they mean. If you do that whole tree chipping, you end up with a much better outcome because you're actually selling chips and although it costs more to produce those chips, the margin is better. But in, um, infill chipping, whole tree chipping, is only available to large scale operations. Like you need 40 hectares at a go to make it worthwhile. You need good road access, so it's more expensive, not so available to smaller scale. If we then look at some of these extra short rotations, so instead of being 12, you bring it back to eight. Two smaller trees, so your harvesting costs go way up. So it makes it less attractive. If we look at the regime where you're growing it, the trees are a bit longer, and you're including a, um, a thinning, you end up with bigger trees, less harvesting costs, so it becomes a more attractive option. But just in itself, letting the trees go to that much longer rotation with the blue gums, you end up getting a better outcome because the trees are bigger, harvesting costs are less, and you're producing better quality wood um, for the processor. If you look at this particular case, the, um, the late clear fall with a T1, so first thinning and a pruning, if you can get a price for your, a premium for those logs, it becomes quite an attractive option. We go back one. And so that's one thing that people need to think about is that, you know, what are your options? Can you afford to wait extra time? Or do you want to stick to your routine 12 year rotation? So in terms of key messages, if you're a private grower, you know, growing the right size tree is one of the key drivers of your profitability making sure that you've done, done the best possible things to make the trees grow, you're managing the stocking, you're getting the trees to the right size. Then you think about doing thinning. You know, can you do a thinning operation? There's some thinning possible in some of the ute plantations. There was some across in, um, in Victoria. Dave Geddes was telling me about a stand he went to not so long ago that had been thinned and the trees were, were quite magnificent. So if you look at um, how you can best improve the, improve the profitability is by having the right number of trees to grow big trees to make the, um, the overall harvesting cheaper. So at the end, for radio out of pine, it's quite attractive to grow that slightly shorter length rotation, as long as you do your thinnings, maximise your trees, and if you can have a larger stocking rate and are certain that you'll be able to get the thinning done on time, that could be quite an attractive regime again. For the blue gums, it seems to be quite attractive to let the blue gums keep growing to they're much larger, uh, potentially do a thinning, and end up with a, a lower harvesting rate. So that's sort of the insights from our first project, bit of a whirlwind tour. There's a lot more information in the report. We structured as a series of subtopics, 
And each subtopic in itself has you know, got lots of gems and um, quite useful information. So with that, I'll um, happy to take any questions, comments or thoughts.